resolution. But uh, we always choose New Year's resolutions, don't we? And most of us fail within the first week, and uh, that's why I'm not starting until tomorrow. <laughs> so I will take care of the first week of the new year, and I'm going to start tomorrow. But we always have New Year's resolutions, you know, losing weight or learning a new skill or hobby, or maybe we want to get organized, save money, and so we'll sign up for the FPU class, or maybe we want a better marriage. There are a lot of different things that we decide that we want to have a New Year's resolution. And maybe some of you are here today because you have decided that you want a better relationship with God this year. And you know, the Bible talks about our relationship with God like a beautiful marriage. God is the husband, we are the wife, he loves us sacrificially, and we serve him faithfully. But there's this idea that I want to carry through for the next four weeks, and it's simply this. How can we have a good marriage with God if we are not divorced from the world. You know, as a Christian, we can certainly look better if we lose weight this year. We can feel better. We can think better. We can learn more skills. But we'll actually never be better if we don't have an active, growing, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so, if I ask you this question, what is the greatest thing that you could accomplish this year? What would it be? If there's only one thing that you could work on, what would that be? Would it be losing weight? Would it be finding a better job? Would it be managing your money? Would it be learning a new skill? Would it be paying down your debt? I mean, if there was one thing that you could do for the next year, what would it be? You know, Jesus was asked a similar question. Somebody came up to Jesus and they asked Jesus, Jesus, what is the greatest thing that we can do? And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 22, and that's where we're going to be to answer this question, the greatest thing that we can do this year. You see, the Pharisees were trying to plot against Jesus. The Pharisees hated Jesus. Jesus really rubbed them the wrong way because Jesus was a teacher, he was a poor carpenter, but he had uh, the Spirit of God. He was God incarnate in him. And so Jesus taught in certain ways and taught certain things that flew in the face of this Pharisaical, legalistic mentality that the religious leaders of the day had. And so the Pharisees decided that they were going to try to trick Jesus because ultimately they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to remove him and get him out of the picture. And Satan wants that same thing for you and I. We have an adversary that works against us, and he wants nothing more than for you and I to have a hateful relationship with God and to get him out of the picture. And so they send one of their own. They send this Pharisee who actually, if you read Mark chapter 12, which is a parallel account, you actually know that this Pharisee isn't a bad guy. I mean, he actually approaches Jesus with interest and respect. He calls him teacher or rabbi, which is a very respectful term of their day. And so they send this good man to do the dirty work for them. Have you ever felt like that? Has that ever happened to you maybe at work or in your family? You're sent to do the dirty work on on behalf of the people around you. So here's this poor soul sent to do the dirty work on behalf of the Pharisees. And we're not sure if this man is made aware whether or not um, he's in this scheme to plot against Jesus. When you read Mark's account, you like to think that he's ignorant to it. But the religious leaders are at work. And they're at work against Jesus. And so this Pharisee comes up and he has this question that he's been told probably to ask Jesus. And here's what it says. It says in verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees was simply this. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. And so the Sadducees, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in in the resurrection. I know, isn't that corny? It's so bad. I'm sorry, okay? That's just what I learned. And the Pharisees were fair, you see, because they did believe and the resurrection. That's an easy way to distinguish between the two. But both groups really hated Jesus because he really rebelled against everything that they had set up because he was God in the flesh. And so they really wanted to plot against Jesus. And verse 35 says this, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You see, Jesus is here in the temple during his final week prior to his crucifixion. So it's only seven days before Jesus is crucified. And tensions are at an all-time high. And he comes up and he asks Jesus this question. And there's a backdrop to this question. You see, the Pharisees, they sought to entangle him before because they asked him a question about the taxes. They hated Rome. And Rome ruled over Jerusalem and they couldn't stand it. And so they were going to do one of two things. They were either going to put Jesus at odds with the Roman Empire by claiming to be king and saying we don't have to pay taxes, or they were going to put Jesus at odds with the Jewish people 
He wanted to be the Messiah and they would reject him because if Jesus said you have to pay your taxes, well, like us, the Jews hated paying taxes, okay? And, uh, and so they were really trying to plot and trick Jesus. And the Sadducees were trying to trip him up on the subject of the resurrection. But when he answered people, it caused people to marvel. They'd step back and they would say, wow, no man spoke. No man has ever spoke like this man. And so here are the lawyers, once again, the Pharisees, trying to trick Jesus, and they send a very intelligent scholar. He's a theological scholar, and they call him a lawyer. Maybe some of your translation has a scribe. And so he knows all there is to know about the law. And he comes to Jesus, and he wants to ask him this question. And so he says, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest thing that we could do as a faithful Jew? And look at Jesus' response in verse 37. And this is the same response that we can take with us today. In verse 37, Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And so while we no longer live under the old law, these two commandments have been carried over into the new covenant. And you can think of it like this, right? There's a lot of Old Testament teachings in the old law. And if you remember this simple phrase, it'll really help you out a lot. What isn't revealed in the new covenant is repealed under the new covenant. And so that's one of the reasons why we gather together on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, and not Saturday like the Jews did. It's because Christians gathered on the first day of the week, the day that Jesus resurrected, the day they came together to break bread, the ushering in of the new covenant, and they did away with, this, with, with, uh, with the seventh day. And so we don't follow that anymore. But we still have these two great commandments that we can follow. And Jesus simply says this, the greatest thing that you can do in 2019 is to love God. And then he says, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, And Mark and Luke add in with all your strength. It basically is this all-encompassing person, and it's simply this. Love God with everything that you are. We're not commanded to love God and serve him emotionally while committing intellectual suicide. We're not commanded to serve God with our mind but with no emotion. We're not commanded to serve God with our emotions and with our mind but not with actual obedience and our strength. No, God is calling us to love him with our mind, with our soul, and with our body, our strength, with everything that we are. That is the greatest thing that we could possibly do in 2019. And here's the deal. If we fail to love God, We run the risk of distancing ourselves from him and having a broken relationship with him. And here's the thing, this broken relationship, it doesn't happen usually overnight. It's a slow fade and we drift away from God each and every day that we don't choose to love him. You know, ships, when do they tend to get overwhelmed by storms? It's when they're out in the middle of the sea. They they don't have the safety of the shore. They don't have the safety of being tied up at the, at the dock. They have slowly but surely drifted away. And when the storm comes, that's when disaster strikes. That's when they become overwhelmed. And that same truth is, is true for you and I. You see, we let the rope out a little bit every day when we don't choose to love God. We, when we don't grow closer to him. When we don't love him with our mind or with our body or with our emotions. And we let that rope out a little bit by a little bit. Next thing we know, we can't even see the dock. We can't even see God. And we feel so distant and so far away. And bad things happen in our life. People die. Jobs get lost. Homes get destroyed. Uh, people hurt each other. And these storms that come into our life overwhelm us because we haven't been loving God. And so my encouragement to you is simply this. Love God and grow closer to him with everything that you are. But how do we do that, right? I think everybody wants to love God that's in here. That's the reason why you're here. You want to hear sermons. You want to sing praise and worship. You definitely want to read your Bible more. You want to do devotionals. You want to serve. You want to give. But we often don't really know how to do that. How do we love God with everything that we are? You know, the Bible says that we have a motivation for loving God. And I think that's the most important place to start. I mean, why did you show up this morning, for instance? To become a better person? To see people that you like? Because you're forced to? You know, somebody was yelling, get out of bed, it's time to go to church. And you're like, I don't want to go. And she's like, you're 50 years old, you need to get up and go to church. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that what carries us through as ultimately our motivation? 
Why do we love God? Well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not bur- burdensome. Okay, God, I understand that I need to love you, and if I'm going to love you, I should obey what you command. And Jesus said the exact same thing in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. But if we have our motivation is stuck in this idea of I just need to keep God's rules and then I love God, we've missed it. Yeah, we might be loving God with our strength and with our bodies. Yeah, we might do and say the right things. Yeah, we might show up to church and give our offering and read our Bibles. But has the word of God, has God's love really penetrated our heart and our mind? Are we loving God in merely actions only? Are we truly loving God with our intellect and our reason and our emotions and our soul and who we are? You see, if all we do is certainly obey rules, we will run out of love. Because rule keeping doesn't keep us connected to God only. We have to get our hearts and our minds engaged. You see, loving God is not like a checklist going to the grocery store. It's more like a garden that you tend to and you grow. And so if you do switch over to Mark's account in Mark chapter 12, when Jesus answers his question, look what the Pharisee responds with. Mark tells us in verse 32, the scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself. And then look what he says. It is much more than burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus had saw that he answered intelligently, he said to him, You, Pharisee, are not far from the kingdom of God. You see, the Pharisee got it. He knew that burnt offerings and sacrifices weren't enough. He knew that God didn't merely want us to go through the motions and attend church and do all the right things, but God wanted us to have affection and love for him in our hearts and in our minds. He wants us to think highly of him and respect him. He wants us to love and respect him with everything that we are. You see, a key idea that I would focus in on is simply this. We must not only have an attitude of love towards God, but a readiness to do anything that God requires. And so to love God means to long for fellowship with him, to delight in his person, to appreciate his characteristics of love and justice, and to be ready and willing to do whatever he asks us to do. And I think sometimes we err on the side that we'll do the things that God asks us to do, you know, like coming to church or tithing or serving, but man, sometimes we have this struggle in our heart and in our minds that we don't want to do it, that we don't feel like doing it, that sometimes we get hurt by God and reading the Bible or praying to God or telling him we love him or accepting God's love to our hearts and to our lives is the last thing that we want to do. It's just like marriage sometimes, isn't it? For those of you who have been married. Yeah, you might be faithful, but sometimes you don't want to be. Yeah, you might be loving, but sometimes you don't want to be. Yeah, you might be respectful, but sometimes you don't want to be. And it's hard to get the heart to catch up with the mind sometimes. You know what you should do and what the right thing to do, but you just don't feel like doing it. And I think that's true for everybody, especially in consideration of our New Year's resolutions. You want to lose weight, but what's the problem? (laughs) Right? You love donuts. That's the problem. You want to read books. The problem is you just don't like to read. I mean, you want to learn a new skill. The problem is you just don't want to have the self-discipline to do it every day. That's where it always comes into conflict. And it's the same truth with our relationship with God. The spirit is truly willing, but the flesh is weak. And so God wants us to respect and trust and esteem him and appreciate him for all that he does. And this Pharisee was smart enough to recognize God wants devotion from the heart and from the mind, not just in sacrifices and in offerings. And don't be mistaken, God wants those things too. But we gotta put things in the right perspective. You see, the old covenant says this in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now Israel, he asked them this question. What does the Lord your God require from you but that you should fear God and to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord with your God, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes which I am commanding you today for your good? He's saying, look, God doesn't just want you to do what he says God wants you to trust him, to recognize that these things that he's asked you to do are actually for your benefit. And so when God says, hey, look, I want you to keep the covenant every Lord's Day, and I want you to show up at church whenever the doors are open, and I want you to break bread, 
And I want you to read the word. And I want you to love and give to other people who are in need. And I want you to make sacrifices. And I want you to put your flesh to death and live in the spirit. And God has all of these things that are in the New Testament that he wants us to do. And they're for our good. And if we're willing to believe that those things are for our good, that means we're willing to trust God and respect him and love him. That's ultimately what he's saying. You see, they obeyed God's commands, but they struggled with loving God from their heart. And God wanted them to serve him with everything that they were in the Old Testament, and God wants those same things for us today. I mean, think about it. What sense does it make for the average person to take an animal and burn it on an altar? You'd be like, well, this this doesn't make any sense right? I mean, if you go to your job and you tell someone, yeah, I give 10% of my paycheck to the church, they are going to look at you like they look at me and they're like, you are insane. How do you all even survive? I mean, who in their right minds gives 10% of their paycheck? For instance, if you got two people in the house and both are making fifty to $60,000 a year, I mean, think about it. You, you would give $10,000 a year, every year to the church. I mean, who in their right mind out in the world is thinking, man, these people are crazy, Right? You can't afford to do that. And we're, we're saying, yeah, but we make this sacrifice. And they say, why do you make this sacrifice? Why do you give? Why do you serve with your talents and your abilities? There are some people who are here every time the doors are open, and they're always willing to do whatever it takes. There are people, for instance, we're getting ready to do a week of winter relief. There are people who have taken entire weeks of vacation to serve 40 homeless people back in our FLC. There are people who take a day of vacation and they stay up from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. They stay here all night to love people who are homeless during the winter time. I mean, think about that. Who makes those kind of sacrifices? And I'll tell you who. It's people that love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. But God isn't merely interested in just the sacrifices that we make. God is interested in us having affection and respect for him from our heart. And so if you've ever asked yourself the question, man, why am I putting myself through this? I mean, church life can be tough. We're doing it because we love God. And when we start with the why, we will always find the right answers to the most difficult questions. Why do I love my spouse? Why do I take care of my kids? Why do I respect my parents? Why do I show up faithfully at my job? Why do I serve and give in the church? Why do I read my Bible every day? Why is it that I do the things that I do? It's because I'm in love with God and he's in love with me. And so when we think about the why, we can focus next on the what. And you know, when I think about our relationship with God, I've already said it before, I think of it like a healthy marriage. And marriage year one should not be the same as marriage year 10. But what do we find sometimes in marriage? Marriage year one is honeymoon phase. And then we get to know the other person. And we're like, man, I don't know if I really like this person. (laughs) Right? I mean, come on, couples. You've been there. The things that they did while you were dating that you never saw, you're like, I never realized they picked their nose and they wiped it on the shower wall. That's disgusting. I've heard wives say that about their husbands. I'm not saying that I do that, okay? That would be really gross, but some of you do that, and shame on you. I mean, think about it. Some of us fold towels the wrong way, and we put toilet paper on the wrong way, and we leave messes. I mean, we do things that we were like, man, I did not really know who I was marrying. Some of us let out big belches, and we burp like really, really loud for a really, really long period of time. You're like, who is this little tiny person that I married? You know, this is insane. And so we do things that drive each other nuts, and we, if we don't love each other every day, we will grow farther, farther apart. In Christianity and in marriage, there is no middle ground. There is no, I'm just staying in the middle or just keeping things as is. You're either moving closer to each other or you're drifting farther away. You're either choosing to love one another or you're choosing not to act in apathy. And so you're not loving each other and you're making a choice. Doing nothing is making a choice. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. Now here's one of the best things that you can do to grow in your love for God. One of the first and foremost things that you can do is to let God love you. Let God love you. Despite all your flaws and imperfections, let God love you through your weaknesses and your trials and your circumstances because he wants to love you and he does love you. And when he saw you at your worst, he still chose to love you. The question is, is whether or not you're going to accept it. Romans chapter 5, 8 says this, God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 
God acted in his love for us when he looked at you before the world ever began and he said, man, I see Rick Bonifield on the worst day of his entire life. I see everything that Rick has done from beginning to end, both good and bad, and I'm gonna move towards him in love. The question is, is whether or not I'm willing to accept God's love and his grace. And here's what we'll find. When you let God love you, When you let God move towards you through the cross, you will embrace God's grace and you will begin to be able to love God back. I've seen people in relationships who've been hurt and damaged and they don't let the other person love them because they think they're awful or they don't deserve to be loved or they've been hurt too many times before and so they build up this wall and this barrier and they don't let anybody in. You don't let people love you. You don't let people hug you or encourage you or give you words of encouragement. You don't let that because you're so hurt. But the moment that you decide to let somebody in, you're afraid that they're going to hurt you. And so you build up a wall. And we can't do that with God. It is grace. It is God's grace that enables us to do good. It is a gift that we do not deserve. And the reason why we don't love much, the reason why we don't love other people is because we haven't let God love us. We need to let God love us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says this. We love Because he first loved us. And so if you want to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you've got to let God's love apply to you. And you've got to be willing to accept it. And so the key idea is simply this. If you want to grow in your love towards God this year, let him love you. Let him love you. The second thing that you can do to grow in your love towards God is to ask him. I mean, sometimes we need to tell people who won't let us love them, will you, will you let me love you? <laughs> will you let me in? Will you let go of those, those strongholds in your heart and the hurt and the pain that you've been holding on to? And will you just let me love you and help you love other people? And we need to ask God to do that in our own heart. God, I need you to help me love you. I need you to give me the opportunity. I need you to give me the strength. I need you to give me the wisdom. God, help me love you. Paul encouraged the church right? The, the group of people called the Thessalonians. He encouraged them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. I mean, he was saying this prayer, may God direct you into love. And sometimes if Paul could pray that for them and ask that for them, we can certainly ask God to do that on our behalf. If you want to grow in your love towards God, let him love you and look for him to lead you into his love. If Paul could pray that for other people, you could pray that for yourself. And so we need to do the greatest thing in 2019. And what is that? Love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And love our neighbors as ourselves. And we're able to do that when we let God love us. When we look for him to lead us into his love. And then finally, when we let him teach us to love. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says this. By this we know that we have come to know him. We know God in our minds if we keep his commandments. If you want to see, if you just want to make a simple distinction, am I authentic or not? Do I keep God's commands or not? Which direction am I moving? Am I moving towards God or am I moving farther away from him? And the fact that you showed up this morning means you are moving towards God. It's an act of love. And he goes on to say this, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word In him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The love of God is perfected in those who keep God's word, who keep his commandments. And so let God lead you. Let God teach you into his love. And the only way he can do that is through his word. And you get his word on Sunday morning when you show up here. I want to encourage you, go online and get a devotional. You can actually pull up your phone, a Bible app. There's tons of free devotionals that are on there. And let God teach you about his love every single day. One of my favorite ones that I went through last year is by Timothy Keller. It's through the Proverbs. It's 365 days through the Proverbs. He's written another one through the Psalms. It's a fantastic devotional. It's short. 10 to 15 minutes. It's got questions and reflections. Tim is a very wise man. Go on Amazon. It's 13 bucks. Open up your word every day and do a devotional, maybe with yourself or with your spouse or with your kids. Let God teach you about his love. You know, when we act in love, our heart will eventually catch up with our head. 
And as I said before, sometimes it's not that we don't know what to do. It's sometimes we just don't feel like doing it. It's not that we know, we don't know what it's like to be a faithful, loving spouse. It's sometimes we just don't feel like doing it. It's not like we don't know what to do at our jobs, right? And sometimes we just don't feel like doing it. But if we act, if we do what we're supposed to do, eventually our hearts will catch up with our heads. Angel and I watched a movie not too long ago called Fireproof. It had been out for some time, um, but we had just come around to, to, to watching it. And there's two main characters in the story. Um, basically, the husband is the main character. He's a firefighter. I encourage everybody to watch the movie. It's actually a good movie. It's a Christian movie. And the wife works in a medical facility. She's, she's a nurse, I think. And so basically, they have grown farther apart every single day. They're at each other's necks. They're criticizing each other. They're not acting in love. The husband's saving up all of his money for a big boat. Meanwhile, she is just wanting to be loved, but she's criticizing him for being selfish. And her parents are, are having major health conditions, and she wants to take that money, you know, that is theirs, not his, and help take care of her parents. But he doesn't want to do that because he wants a really big boat. And so they have finally just had enough of each other, and they're going to get a divorce. And so he, he's done. They're both Christians, though, so that's, that's the challenge. And so the firefighter's father comes into the picture, and he challenges his son to love his wife for 40 days through action. And he gives him this book called The Love Dare. And you can actually go online as well, and you can buy The Love Dare. It's 40 days of love. And he said he, he didn't want to do it at first, right? He told his dad, look, it's over. It's not going to work out. I don't want to do this. And his dad encouraged him. He says, fine. But after 40 days... We're getting a divorce. I'll make sure I do the right thing and I'll finish strong. But after 40 days, I can tell you it's not going to work out. And uh, it's just, I'm, I'm done. And then we'll finally get a divorce. And the dad said, okay. And so, of course, day one, he buys flowers. Day two, he cleans the kitchen. Doesn't want to do it, but he does it anyways because he's trying to get his heart to catch up with his head. And day 10 goes by and his wife is done with him. She's rejected him. I mean, ladies, is it not true when you're done, you're done right? <laughs> so word of warning, guys, you can only push your wives so far. And then they're like, hey, look, I've had enough. And so she had had enough and she was done. Day 20 went by, nothing. Day 30 went by, nothing. Day 40 went by, nothing. But you know something? As the days went by and he chose to act in love, his heart began to catch up with his head. And he began to feel affection for his wife again. And he began to love her. And she became the most important thing to him in the world. And I'm not going to tell you how it ends because you need to watch the movie yourself, right? But the point is, when we act in love towards our spouses, just like when we act in love towards God, our heart will eventually catch up with our head. You know the thing about exercise is if you do it for 21 days straight, you're going to crave it. You're going to love it. When you get up at 6 a.m., if you struggle getting up early and you do it for 21 days straight, all of a sudden, you're going to find out, hey, man, I need this. I want to get up early. It's when you get your mind set on a principle and a goal and you follow through with it and your heart eventually catches up. And that's how it is with God. The greatest thing that you can do this year is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And if you choose to act in love towards God, he will draw near you. And your heart to want to follow and please God will eventually catch up with your head. And this is so very true. And so this morning, I want you to give God permission to have his way with you, to let him love you, let him lead you into his love, and let you teach him. Uh, let, let him teach you into his love. And I'm going to end with this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. And Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, and of course, they're struggling with their love towards each other, they're struggling with their love towards God, and everything's a complete mess. I mean, they're probably about the worst church in the Bible. It's, it's about as bad as you can get. Uh, people are living in sexual morality, people don't really care about apostolic truth, the church, I mean, they're getting up, and they're shouting out loud, and they're speaking in tongues, and there's no interpretation. I mean, can you imagine coming in here right now, and as I'm preaching, you get random people popping up like popcorn, speaking in languages that you've never heard or studied before? You'd be like, these people are insane, I'm out of here, right? And then they start moving towards you to touch you, and you're like, man, this is weird, I'm gone. I mean, these are the kind of things that was happening in the early church, and Paul says, look, Speaking in tongues is for the unbeliever, not for the believer. And if you're going to speak in languages you've never studied before by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you better have an interpreter. Otherwise, everyone else is going to think they're crazy. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I mean, they've got all kinds of problems, okay? 
And then they were even baptizing people for the dead. So for instance, people that I loved, right, that have passed away, I get baptized on their behalf. And Paul has to straighten them out. And so he does that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And they are so confused about the resurrection. And so he spends 50 plus verses giving them the order of the resurrection, telling them exactly what's going to take place, teaching them New Testament Christianity. That's why we have the Bible today. And so the church is a complete mess. And Paul instructs them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, the greatest thing that you can do is to love each other. He says, yeah, you could have the greatest faith to move mountains. You could give everything that you have to the poor. You could even give your body on a cross to be burned. But if you don't have love for each other, it is worthless. It's worthless. And then he moves into chapter 16. And he says, hey, so-and-so is going to come see you. So-and-so is going to come see me. He's giving them instructions about the coming and going. And then it almost seems like out of nowhere. If you didn't know the context, out of nowhere in verse 22, he says, those who do not love God, let them be accursed. Let them be cut off. And it's this backdrop of the resurrection in chapter 15. And here's what Paul's saying. There are eternal consequences if we don't love God. And what's interesting about this passage of scripture is that he uses a different Greek word for love. The Greeks had three, four different words for love. Agape love is divine love. It's the love of God. But he doesn't use that here. He says phileo love. It's a, it's a second grade word for love. It's affection. It's brotherly love. It's not the self-sacrificial divine love that God has for us. And here's what he's saying. God's willing to work with you. But you got to at least have some form of affection for God. Even if it's not the divine love yet, you've got to be able to move towards God and to love him and work towards loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And if you're not moving towards loving God, there are eternal consequences at stake. You're going to be cut off. You're not going to get to participate in the resurrection. And so that's what's at stake. And so my encouragement to you is to let God love you. Let him lead you into his love and let him teach you about his love so that you are enabled to love God and love the people around you. That is the greatest thing that you can do in 2019. Let's stand and let's pray.